Baba says this is a dream. The Course in Miracles says this is an illusion. How are we to know what our home is, what is real? Trust in Swami. If Swami calls, when Swami speaks, when he starts a discourse, he doesn't say, um, my dear merchants and housewives, he calls you Divyatma Swarupalara. He calls you Prema Swarupalara. He says you are the very embodiment of the divine love, of the divine Atma. Who are you going to believe? Your little experiences, your little mind, your little uh, voice that tells you I'm just this little insignificant one in a world that's impacting on me? Or are you going to believe Swami? You're in a dream of awakening and it's just minutes, maybe even just seconds from midnight. It's all going to be over very quickly. There's nothing here for you. Nothing here at all. There's nothing of any value here at all. And when he asked me what's happening, and I said, they, Swami, they're saying I'm a CIA agent. He said, you are CIA. You are CIA. I said, no, Swami, I have nothing to do with the CIA. Yes, you do. You are CIA. You are constant, integrated awareness. You are pure awareness. You are constant, ever unchanging. And you are totally integrated and included in me. I mean, Swami is totally internalized. I don't know the difference between me and Swami. I can say that directly. I don't know the difference. I know who I am, and I am Swami. Welcome to Soul Journeys and an interview with Sai Baba follower Al Drucker. Drucker lived at Sai Baba's ashram in Puttaparthi, India for 10 years. A former physicist, pilot, and naturopath, Drucker has written and talked extensively about Eastern spirituality and Sai Baba. This interview was recorded in Grants Pass, Oregon in July 2003. Al Drucker, thanks a whole lot for agreeing to do this and to sit still while other people pick away at you lovingly. Uh huh. Can I begin by asking you, for those who are brand new here to Sai Baba, and there are several people, for you to give us your gut feeling answer to the question of who is Sai Baba? Sai Baba is myself. Sai Baba is my true self. I have no other identity than that. One time I was arrested in, in India. This is a long answer to a short question. <laughs> uh, I was arrested in India on the day that I was to become an Indian citizen and naturalize in India. And they arrested me because it was alleged that I was a CIA agent. And when I refused to go with the constable who arrested me and said, I have to first see Sai Baba, he agreed to that. And I went to see Swami, and Swami very graciously talked to me. And when he asked me what's happening, and I said, they, Swami, they're saying I'm a CIA agent, he said, you are CIA. You are CIA. I said, no, Swami, I have nothing to do with the CIA. Yes, you do. You are CIA. You are constant, integrated awareness. You are pure awareness. You are constant, ever unchanging. And you are totally integrated and included in me. That is who I am. That is what you can say you are. And that is Sai Baba. He has come at the end of this yuga for no other purpose but to reveal the truth of who I am. That I am is not this Al Drucker sitting in front of you. That I am is the I am that spoke out of the burning bush to Moses and said, I am that am. That is the pure aham, the pure subjective with no regard for any 
nothing else that could be thought of as objective. There is only that I am, and that is Sai Baba, and that I am. Who was the Al Drucker of 20 to 40 years ago before you became this I am? A meaningless idea in my mind that I chose to buy into that no longer works for me. Meaningless. Nothing. Nothing at all. Baba wants us to know that we are God, as you've said now ten times this morning along. Does this mean we no longer pray? You can't help but pray. Every breath is a prayer. You know, in both Sanskrit and in Hebrew, in both holy languages, the same word is used. Ruach, Hakodesh, Ruach, which is the Hebrew word for it, both means energy. It means life. It means vitality. And it means holiness. And it means prana. It means the power of God. That is the constant prayer that is happening all the time. You begin to recognize that your life itself is a prayer. You don't pray for things. You don't pray even to... Uh, all you pray for is for the continuousness of that CIA, of that constant integrated oneness with the unity. And that is my life, and that is your life. Whether you know it or not, why not know it? I tell you it is, so be it, be it now. Dust if you think, dust you are. God if you think, God you are. You are not dust, you are not the body, you are God. This may seem like a pretty silly question in light of Go what ahead. you just said. If, since you are Sai Baba, no, don't do it like that. Okay. Do you get to see? Don't do it like do that. Do you get to see or feel? Or Excuse hear? me. I once have to say. Once I said to uh, Swami, he said, "Who are you?" And I said, "Swami, I am one with you. I am uh, Baba." He said, "Oh, that is very, very good. Okay, now you go out and give darshan." <laughs> <laughs> and you did. <laughs> the question is, do you get to see or feel or hear intuitively or in your heart or in your ears, Sai Baba, much? Well, it's, uh, I don't know how to say this. It's not a voice that I hear, but it is a constant dialogue that I have. I just constantly talk to him in inside. And uh, it's not that I hear a voice responding. It's just that it, it, it's just, I'm, I'm just always talking to him. Swami, you know, I just share my, my uh, perceptions with him. And, and so he's, he's very much in my mind. Uh, if there is something to be done, uh, I would generally ask him. I mean, I think uh, always ask him first. I, don't, I can honestly say that uh, for probably 30 years, I have not made any decisions on my own. Not a single decision. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm not sure what his will is, because I still see myself as outside of him. I mean, I fall into that all the time. It doesn't mm -hmm. last very long, but it, it, it does happen. And so I'm a little bit confused as to what, what is your will, and I don't hear a voice. Uh, uh, and so, uh, and when my booty is not awake at that moment, when there's not that, that intuitive knowing, then I will use the chits, and he's given that. And that's a good thing to know about, and uh, shall I just pass it on yes. to you for a moment? He said, if you don't, if you want to uh, assess my will, and you're not sure, then here's what you do. Take two little pieces of paper, or little pieces of cardboard, or buttons, or two little stones, something that you feel you can, um, assign some holiness to, and write on it, on one of them yes, on the other one no, and on the back side put an ohm. So yes ohm and no ohm, okay? And then sit in front of the altar, sit in front of, come to your little inner sanctum of holiness in the field that you're in, in the place that you're in, in your home preferably, and just uh, still your mind. And then 
in your mind evoke my presence, my image, and then ask the question in a way that I can answer with a yes and no. And then just use your chits and throw them. <laughs> and I will give you an answer. This is a red phone that you have, and it's a direct line to me. And I will always give you the right answer, but don't test me. <laughs> if you don't like the answer, don't try it again. Mm -hmm. So now, just think about that a moment. I'm sorry to take no. up more time here, but think about that a moment. This says you can get a yes ohm, you can get a no ohm, you can get an ohm ohm, and you can get a yes no. <laughs> there are four possibilities. You know, we generally ask a question in such a way that we want a yes answer. Well, our statistical probabilities have just gotten down to 25% of getting that answer that we generally want. Hmm? And so just trust that the divinity will give you the right answer. And so a yes ohm is a yes, a no ohm is a no. Mm -hmm. A yes, no is this is not my business. This question is not my business. You go do what you do, but I will not guide you in this one. And an ohm ohm is wait. And so wait means wait. And you don't immediately ask again. You wait and let, that is also an answer. And you will see it happening. For those of us who don't have stones or run out of stones or forget use to buttons. use the stones or the buttons, uh, and this is sort of related, in fact it's very much related, how do we discern between the will of God and our own ego or desire? See, let me, of course I will answer as best as I can, but let me just go back to the stones a moment. When I heard that, about these chits, at that time I was doing the <coughs> once a week talks at the Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning. The whole university gets together in the morning at the beginning of the school day and we sing the Om Tat Sat Sri Narayana to the many names of God as given by Mahatma Gandhi. It's his song huh? and it's done all over India. And then one of the teachers will talk about the five great religions and will give some quotes and some little discussion from the religions. And I was given the one to do of the Torah and the Jewish religion, the, what we know as the Old Testament. And it's at that time that I heard about these uh, chits that uh, I read about in, it's even given in Exodus, um, where it is said that the high priest will wear a, a little um, pouch on the front uh, with 12 uh, uh, stones representing the 12 tribes, or the 12 rays, you might say. Um, and in, the, in that pouch are two stones called the Urim and the Tumim. And those stones will always be used to assess the will of God. And so when there is a question as to what the people should do, he will, um, the high priest will pose that question in the inner sanctum and uh, these stones will tell him. So here was a, a, just as we just heard a little bit of the, of the Old Testament, a validation, a confirmation of Swami is still teaching us the same ancient wisdom. It never really changes whether it be from the Old Testament or from any other um, mystical religion and where great beings have come into their own truth. All right, so how do we know that we are uh, following the will of God? And so what Swami says is everyone has a conscience. You know what is right and you know what is not right. You will know it by how you feel. You will know if you feel some guilt or if you feel some fear or if you feel anything other than great peace and happiness. If that's what you feel, you can be sure it is not my will. And if you feel just a, uh, an inner sense of serenity and wholeness, know that that is my will. Mm -hmm. Good and question here. That's very easy to come to if you just pay attention to it. Again, CIA. 
Somebody here wants to know, when were you first aware of the existence of God? <laughs> well, when I was a little boy, this was in the time before Hitler. This is before 1933, and before Hitler came to power. At that time, the great uh, uh, sort of uh, German hero was uh, Field Marshal von Hindenburg. <laughs> and in Germany, we have a carnival uh, every year, and uh, people dress up in various clothes, and they have a good time at the carnival. A lot of kids get conceived during carnival time. And they dressed me up as a field marshal, a little kid, a little four-year-old dressed up as a field marshal. Everybody would come up to me and said, Don't befail, Herr Feldmarschall. And I heard a voice, it is unmistakable, I heard it then, it has never left me, and it said, No, you are not a field marshal, you are a prince. And I said, I am a prince. A prince is one who knows and already has his kingdom who you can throw into the gutter, you can say anything to and do anything to, and he will never lose his royalty. He's a prince, and he's the son of his father. And I knew that from that time, and it has never left me all the times in Germany and all the uh, difficult times that this body has gone through in its life. It, it always, underneath, has been this, this uh, absolute certainty that I was a child of God and that nothing could ever happen to me. And I would strongly suggest to you to repossess your princedom and know that you are a prince or a princess or that you are royalty itself. You are the Holy One. You are the one that has been chosen. You have been chosen because you are one with God. Whatever else you've ever thought and whatever littleness that you have assigned to yourself has been an arrogance on your part to keep yourself separate. And that day is done. None of the disguises are going to work ever again. You're only going to trip up and trip up and trip up until you get the lesson that none of that works. You are not this body. You are not this mind that has allied itself with an ego. You are not in this world. This, you are an alien here. There is no place for you to rest here. Go home, because you are already home. Just realize it. Baba says this is a dream. The Course in Miracles says this is an illusion. How are we to know what our home is, what is real? Trust in Swami. If Swami calls, when Swami speaks, when he starts a discourse, he doesn't say, um, my dear merchants and housewives, he calls you Diviatma Swarupalara. He calls you Prema Swarupalara. He says you are the very embodiment of the divine love, of the divine Atma. Who are you going to believe? Your little experiences, your little mind, your little uh, voice that tells you I'm just this little insignificant one in a world that's impacting on me? Or are you going to believe Swami? What good is Swami if you don't believe him? What good are his words if you don't trust that he knows and he knows better than I know? I don't know anything. Of myself, I am nothing. Of my truth, I am everything. That's the key. Huh? Trust. I mean, the first thing, of course, is you have to believe in him. He says, I will give you what you want so that you will want what I have to give you. What I have to give you is that, is the, is the glorious portal to your liberation and it is available to you and it is available so easily all you have to do is say help show me and he will show you but you have to trust that what he shows you is true a questioner wants to know is consciousness all there is pragnanam brahma the great mahavakas the great sayings of the upanishads aham brahmasmi tattvam asmi I am Atma Brahman. One of those great sayings is Pragnanam Brahma. C consciousness, awareness, the CIA, huh, is all there is. That is all there ever is. I spoke yesterday of uh, a time when I left this body 
I can't even say I left this body because there was no I really in that consciousness. It was just pure consciousness. And that consciousness had, in retrospect, looking at it, had the characteristics of the pure witness. It's called the Sakshi in Sanskrit. Pure witness, just watching. No investment of any kind, and yet total awareness of all. Huh? That witness is the witness of these five sheaths. That is what is meant by tat twam asi. That thou art. Huh? Thou, who you are, is that witness of all things. That that, that tat, is the Satchitananda. It's not the nama and rupa, the name and form that covers it and veils it and hides it from our seeing. We see the names and forms and we think that this is what has some power and reality. But none of this has any reality. God itself, which is all that really... For those who haven't been blessed with the experiences that you've had, you've been kicked in the pants by Baba many times in wonderful, miraculous ways, life-saving ways, yet they're still on a spiritual path and want to grow their path without experiences like yours. How do they do it? Everyone has experiences. You couldn't have made it to here. Every every moment. How many times have you driven down the highway? What about that truck that was heading for you when, that, when the mind of that uh, truck driver just got sleepy for a moment? Who saved you at that moment? How many thousands of opportunities have there been where you've been saved and you, you've been held in the divine arms? Everything is a gift. Nothing can possibly happen to you that is not in your best interest. Nothing. All things are echoes of the voice for God. That's one of the lessons in the, in the Course in Miracles, Swami's Course in Miracles. Everything is a gift. You have nothing to do but to be grateful. I mean, language becomes very, very simple. It just becomes yes. Yes, thanks, wow. That's about all you ever need to continue on through life. You're not having to do anything. You need do nothing. It is all given to you. It is given to you and it is being done through you. And so, yes, I've been blessed with many experiences, but some experiences I haven't spoken of, such as, for instance, being thrown out of the ashram. Hmm? Huh? That's an important experience. That's one of the greatest blessings that's ever happened to me. By far the greatest blessing that's ever happened to me in, in, in my limited consciousness. But at the time, it was a total devastation. Everything is a gift. Accept it all. Don't um, return to the weakness of feeling some guilt about what you've done. There is no guilt. There is no human being in truth. There is only God. I am not this body. I am one with my Father. Just hold on to that idea. Face the light. Put the shadow behind you. The shadow is not my business. It is the shadow of this body. That body itself is part of the shadow. That is not my business. My business is God. Just face the light. And that light, as it rises, even the shadow will disappear at my feet. Al Drucker, you're 75, pushing 80. From where do you get your boundless passion for life and energy? Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sweet question. All I can say is I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When you came back into the body after your liver cancer death, one person wants to know, was the absence of suffering along with physical pain related to being free of the emotional body? No, no, the emotional body was very much present, but it was present, uh, it, it no longer governed me. It no longer directed what I, what I thought and was and, and, uh, and felt and uh, abided in, you might say. Huh? And so the emotional body was very strong. And uh, I'd get caught in, uh, uh, for moments, but uh, golly, it just lasts so little. You know, they say that it, uh, it's like 
writing in the sand on the water. It doesn't last very long. Whereas before, it's like writing in stone, you know, inscribed deep in the stone. Nothing lasts very long anymore. And I can absolutely trust that the return to wholeness will always come. Om Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamudachyate, Purnasya, Purnadaya, Purnameva, that's all there is, Eva, that's all there is. It will always return, and it will return for you as well. In fact, there is no difference. Please. <laughs> do, do you have... I have, to get, I have to get off my high horse here. You, uh, ask me a do down you, low question. Do you have any <laughs> words to assist people who are suffering from long-term physical pain? And I might add those who are also on the receiving end of prognoses that we all have, but they're aware of a more imminent fate than, than many of us are. Well, I was suffering from a pretty serious prognosis. The suffering I was suffering from when I went to Swami was the knowledge that at any moment, night or day, given, oh, I would say, no more than 15 minutes, upwards of 5,000 nuclear weapons might be in the air. Any moment, night or day, it could happen with a computer glitch. There was actually no way, to my knowledge, as we knew it at that time, that we could prevent that. That's a pretty serious prognosis. And so what did Swami say to me? He said, forget the world. The world is not your business, sir. This is just more world. Don't get caught up in it. It is your arrogance that gets caught up in it. It's not your humility that gets caught up in it. It is a way, death is an idea made up by the mind to maintain its separation. If you die and somebody else doesn't die, it makes you different, doesn't it? <laughs> or if he dies and I don't die, it makes you different. Anything to uh, fortify this long-standing rut through thousands of lives of being special. There is no specialness. Even Swami is not special. For, forgive me for saying so, but there is nothing special anywhere. All there is is exactly the same. And that sameness is the pure love of God. That's all there is. As I said the other day, there are no objects anywhere. Nothing is an object, including God. You can't speak of it as a he or a she or an it. It is a verb. It is a river of love flowing out into more and more of itself and ever remaining itself. That is my nature. That is my truth. Hold on to that. And everything will be taken care of. This body will be used for what it will be used. And when it's time to set it aside, it's just a vehicle. You, you came here in a vehicle. You set it outside in the parking lot. And you're here. You don't have to worry about that thing. Don't be concerned about it. Everything will be given, including what is given to take care of these bodies. It is not about these bodies. It is about the doctor that needs to hear uh, the message of love. And that message may be a silent message of just your uh, equanimity in the face of, of what might scare anyone else. Just go home in God and hold that, hold on to that. My guess is this question written by somebody among us uh, is something a lot of us can relate to. Do you have any words of wisdom for those of us recovering rescuers who do too much seva without discrimination and need to spend more time discovering Atma? Yes, yes. Um, I was, uh, I changed my training from my engineering and physics background. I was part of a small group of uh, technical people in a secret uh, organization that had um, the responsibility for all the ballistic missile programs in the U.S. arsenal, including all the nuclear weapons. We were just a very small group, and we were constantly on the go. Uh, 
it was clear to me that that was not to be my life. And so I shifted. And I shifted to become a healer. I studied medicine, and I studied acupuncture, and I studied uh, a number of different systems. And I was doing a lot of treatment of people, and I found myself getting more and more sick. And then one time when I went to Sami, he said, you are too sensitive now. You uh, stop doing treatments, and you become a teacher. You teach. And so from that point on, I was doing teaching. And many doctors came into our programs. This was at Esalen Institute, um, and others as well. And then uh, one day in India, a good friend who was a well-known person at that time, Gregory Bateson, some of you may have heard of him. Bateson was the husband of uh, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead. And when she died, uh, he remarried. And his new wife, Lois, became a Sai devotee and went off to India and left Gregory behind. And Gregory didn't like being left behind. And so he would come along, and he was an anthropologist, and so he would uh, uh, study the natives in India. He'd come to Darshan and sit in this little stool in the back and uh, uh, do his naturalist thing. And Swami loved him and came up to him many times. And how is the professor today? And how is the professor doing? Excuse me, I'll try to shorten the story. Uh, but, uh, and one fine day, Swami called him and a number of us in for an interview. And Gregory was so excited because he couldn't manage with all these devotees who just kept talking about God and singing their bhajans. And he, he was a serious type. You know, he wanted to... Um, his father was a famous don from uh, Cambridge University in India. And uh, uh, he, he was an intellectual. He was a great intellectual. And so he wanted to engage Swami in intellectual talk, but something with, with good meaning. So, um, he was part of the University of, um, he was in the University of California, and he was part of the regions of the university. And the regions was responsible for all the nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Um, the regions had a, a yearly budget of $35 billion. And he wanted to get out of that. And so he wanted to engage Swami and ask him about how, uh, if Swami agreed, and and Swami wouldn't have any of it. He didn't uh, engage with, uh, when Swami called him in, all Swami asked him, and how is your health, sir? <laughs> and Gregory said, my health is very good, sir, and how is yours? <laughs> <laughs> and then when Swami asked him some other silly questions, um, Gregory just left the interview room and said, thank you very much. And he came out sort of storming. He said, you can't hold a decent conversation with a holy man. And he, uh, and he, and he took off for, for California, where he had a regents meeting, a New Year's Day regents meeting. Um, and he left his wife and child there in India. Is it OK to tell a sure. story? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Gregory got very sick on the flight to America. They took him off the plane and, uh, with an ambulance and took him to the University Hospital in Berkeley. And there they discovered, when they d did an x-ray, a huge carcinoma on his aorta. And there was almost no chance that they could save him. But they did an exploratory surgery and just opened up that, uh, that thoracic wall all the way up. And they found that the cancer was actually on the aorta. It was not even on the uh, lung where they uh, originally thought it might be. And uh, it was simply not operable. And so they sewed him up and gave him two or three weeks to live. And word was sent to his wife in India. And, uh, and she immediately came home. But now, after Swami gave an interview to Gregory, he called me in. And he said, do you know that old man, that professor who was just here? I said, yes, Swami, I'm a friend of the family. I brought them uh, to Swami. He said, 
that man is very sick, he will die, but Swami will save him. You go and nurse him. You nurse him. I said, Swami, you told me not to do treatments anymore. No, it is all right. You nurse him. And the short of it is, I mean, it's quite a story, but the short of it is, is, is that I took on Gregory's cancer and died mm -hmm. instead of Gregory. Every day I would go and see him. I brought him to our place at Esalen, Esalen Institute, and there every day, he almost died on the way there, and uh, in the most remarkable way, he came back to life because we found a remedy, and it was a homeopathic remedy. Mm -hmm. And I would sit um, in the sands at that time, outside the uh, Nilium uh, in, in India, and I would study the rare and unusual homeopathic remedies. There are some hundred or so, um, what are they called? The bell. I've, I've even forgotten. I haven't used uh, all this for so long. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, it's, um, they're, they're the important remedies. And then there's some two or three thousand very rare remedies. You can't even find them in most homeopathic pharmacies. Uh, but I would study them. And I, study, and I remember studying one of the rem remedies. I've forgotten its name. It was a long Latin, they're all Latin names. Uh, it's funny that I just uh, don't remember it at the moment. But it's a very strange name. And that remedy was the perfect remedy for Gregory when they, he was transported up the coast, up the, uh, the Big Sur coast to Esalen, because he was about dead. He was almost dead. He couldn't keep anything down. He was vomiting a lot of blood, and, he was, uh, and it looked like he was finished. And uh, on the thigalum umbilatum, <laughs> I remembered that remedy, a very rare remedy, and I called every homeopathic pharmacy in the country. <laughs> I called every homeopathic pharmacy in the country, and then I called the homeopathic pharmacies in Germany and in England, and nobody had ornithagulum umbilatum. One of them said that they can uh, uh, make it ready, but it would take about 10 days. And Gregory had hours, literally, to live. And I had a friend who was an herbalist, and um, he became a very famous uh, herbalist. Um, and I said, Michael, Michael Tierra, I said, Michael, do you have any idea if Ornithogalum umbilatum is an herb? He said, of course, it's the Star of Bethlehem. It's all over the, the uh, 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 mountains out here. Uh, and this is the time. This is the time when it's uh, in bloom. This is, it's perfect. He said, let's go and get some. And we got some Star of Bethlehem, little tiny flower, beautiful uh, plant. He says, this is Ornithogalum umbilatum. And, uh, and sure enough, we made a homeopathic remedy and gave it to Gregory, and it was miraculous. I mean, you understand, it was Swami. <laughs> it was Swami. And like that, every day would do something for, uh, with him, and I got sicker and sicker and sicker, and this body lost 40 pounds and went off to, uh, to a cancer place in, in Mexico to learn a, a particular therapy, the Gerson therapy, and came home and died and I was out of my body, and I g gave you that uh, mm -hmm. little story, and then came back in, and I knew it was all finished, and all I wanted to do was go see Swami. And Swami said, cancer, cancel. <laughs> and Gregory lived on for four years, had his most important work. He, he just totally changed from an irascible old Englishman to a beautiful, lovely, full-spirited human being who loved everyone. He never admitted to loving God, but he clearly saw God <laughs> everywhere. And he was beautiful. And when he finally, when it was finally time for him to go, uh, it turned out that the cancer, they took another x-ray in the hospital, and you could have laid one x-ray on top of the other. The cancer had literally been canceled. There was no cancer. He died of some medicines that were given to him that were too strong. But it was time for him to go, and there were devotees around him singing bhajans to him, and it was just a beautiful uh, finish for him. He was done with that body. He was in his 80s, and he was done.
Your spontaneous reaction to two Forgive words. Forgive me for these long talks and answers. Your spontaneous reaction to two words. Fear and anger. Love. Do you get angry? <laughs> You're damn right. <laughs> <laughs> I get totally... Hey, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> and it lasts for about 30 seconds. <laughs> Here's somebody who's totally peeved. So we leave here today and go back to our normal job. Wait, let me say something, though. Really, uh, um, you know, Swami said The Course in Miracles is, is his work. He, he, um, he said, this is my highest work, this is the Vedanta for the West. He's uh, given that and signed it a number of times. And in the Course, it makes it very clear that it's always only love or fear. And that fear is what covers love, and fear is non-existent. It is something we make up in order to keep ourselves separate. And so, if you want to experience the truth, if you want to experience the love, and this is not the love that is a love for our, our own, it is the unlimited, unconditional, ever-expanding love of God. Huh? That is our truth. If you want to experience that, go into the heart of the fear. You've got to, don't avoid it, don't avoid these negative feelings, but go right into them, stand in them in a moment. Don't, uh, um, you can invite them in, but you don't have to serve them coffee, Swami <laughs> said. <laughs> <laughs> but do let them in for a moment, huh? and just stand still in that, and you will be shown that even the thickest fog can't even hold a, a button. It can't even hold a little paper airplane. You understand? That all there is, is love, is the love of God. And we have constructed these artificial uh, clouds and coverings on top of them. Go right into them. Don't avoid them. Go into them and you'll discover what, what they hide. And what they hide is the only truth there is. There might be variations of this question okay. that a lot of us can relate to. So here we leave today and go back to our normal jobs, Al, which are very spiritually and financially unrewarding. How do we, <laughs> how can we really do all that when it, the people, the environment, all of it is so negative? It's negative because you want it that way. Yes, you want it that way. You choose to be the victim so that you can see the victimizer outside of you and thereby maintain your separation. There is nothing unrewarding, there is nothing dark out there except in your mind. There is nothing out there except in your mind. Your mind is all of it. Nothing is going on. Everything, everyone that you picture is in heaven. You're the only one still flailing around, not having gotten the word that you too are already in heaven, home in God, as God. So change your mind. Change your mind about what is. It is the seeing that you see which reflects the wish that you wish which is to be separate from God because of your fear of the love of God. You're afraid you're going to disappear in it. Disappear in it. Become it. It is you. Don't be afraid of it. There is nothing going on here except your dream. You are the dreamer of this dream and it is a dream of separation which you have concocted and it is no longer true and you will no longer get away with it. None of the disguises will work from this point on. There's only going to be pain and suffering until you realize that it is my pain, my suffering, that I'm, it's a battle that I have in my own mind against myself. And stop it, what for? 
What for when Swami is here showing you that there is another way? Love. Just love. Jesus showed us the way too. If they want your cloak, give them your undercloak as well. Give them everything. Just always give love. Your Savior is standing outside of you asking to save you. That Savior is who? I told the story of the, um, what was it the other day? The, uh, um, of the, of the uh, sweeper. Huh? <laughs> I told the story of the sweeper, right? Your sweeper is your savior. The one who is rejecting you is God, showing you that there is something deeper than that, which is only love. Just love. Just love. Don't look for opportunities not to love. Don't look for excuses. You go into doing your work and there nobody seems to have the, the high-minded uh, belief system that you have and so you feel like you're in some foreign land, you're not at home. You're at home. You're at home in God. Bring that, that love. You don't have to start using words of Sai or words of, uh, of the Vedanta or any of the grandiose thoughts. Just bring your smile. Bring your love. And feel it. I mean, actually feel it. Because you have Swami. What a gift. What an incredible gift has been given. You're in a dream of awakening. And it's just minutes, maybe even just seconds from midnight. It's all going to be over very quickly. There's nothing here for you. Nothing here at all. There's nothing of any value here at all. And yet, when that change gets made in your mind, what are you going to discover? That everything here is God. That there's only God. A related question. You just said, so change your mind. Yeah. Baba has said repeatedly, we have about as much free will as an ass tied to a hitching post. <laughs> How on earth do we change our mind if we don't have free will? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit of free will. You have no free will at all. None. But it seems like you do. I'm going to give you an answer, but just uh, hold, uh, hold a moment. <laughs> So, the Mahabharata war is about to start tomorrow. And today, on the field of battle, are arrayed all the armies. The armies on the sides of the Pandavas, the sides of good, the sides of Dharma, and the army on the sides of Adharma. Krishna, you've chosen to become my charioteer. Take me out between the armies and let me see how we have to order our battle to tomorrow, Arjuna says. And Krishna takes him and he takes him too close to the other army where Arjuna can see his beloved grandfather, Bhishma, who he loves more than any other, his father, uh, Pandu, uh, left when the Pandavas were just small children, and they were brought up by the grandfather, Bhishma. And there is Bhishma on the other side. He had to kill Bhishma, and he also knew that Bhishma, Bhishma couldn't be killed. He had a boon from God that he could never be killed. And yet he, he was uh, such a powerful generalissimo that in charge of the army on the other side that there was no way this side could ever win. Arjuna's side, side of righteousness, could ever win. And there he saw Bhishma, his beloved grandfather, on the other side. He had to fight him. He had to try to kill him. He probably would get killed by him. And then he saw Drona, his beloved uh, teacher, his guru, the one who taught him everything, on the other side. 
And then he saw not only all his cousins, his hundred cousins, the Kauravas, but also many beloved friends on the other side. And he threw down his bow and he said, I cannot fight. And then he turned to Krishna, who was his friend, his bosom buddy. They'd been together for 70 years, always together. They were actually, inter um, Krishna's sister was Arjuna's wife. They were brothers-in-laws. And he turns to Krishna and he says, for the first time in all these years, he says, Lord, Lord, not buddy. He says, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Please show me. Total surrender to one who is higher, who knows. And then Krishna gives him the Bhagavad Gita there on the battlefield that tomorrow would create so much carnage that by the end of the war, which lasted 18 days, millions and millions of the cream of Indian manhood would be, would be dead. Only seven or eight survived. The five Pandavas and three others survived out of these millions that were going to be in, in combat. And Krishna gave him the Bhagavad Gita. And at the end of the Gita, the next to the last sloka of the Gita, 700 verses, and then the, at the end of, of that he gives him this verse. And he says, now I have given you my highest teaching. I have given you all my wisdom. I have given you the, the mysteries. Now think it over and do as think it over and do as you wish. In other words, free will. Yes? Free will, no. Ten minutes left. Try to get as many of the questions that the people have given us. <laughs> okay. This is one of my favorites here. If this doesn't bring a smile to your face, then I don't know anything. Okay, I'll smile. Just Why like do Psy followers often experience a lack of money? <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> related, would you comment on boredom and depression? Is it required to know happiness and bliss? Boredom and depression, is it required? Well, I just told the story mm -hmm. of how Arjuna was clearly rejected, depressed. Uh, I don't think he was bored. That's a little different kind of a feeling. But he was hopeless. hopeless. He was a great... He was a great generalissimo. He was a great uh, fighter. He, he had prepared for this. For, Swami said they were both in their 80s at that time. lived much longer. And he and Krishna had been together for some 70 odd years. And, um, and he was a, a great warrior. And uh, knew how to be in the world. He was also a great prince of a mighty kingdom. I'm sorry, I lost my train of... Give me the question again. What, uh, oh, about depression. Yeah. But here he felt depressed because he said, uh, this is not a world that I'm in. I'm, I, uh, this is a spiritual uh, depression that I'm in. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's my dharma. What is the right thing to do? Is it to kill all these, these beloved grandfathers and, 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 and cousins and family? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that the right thing to do? I throw down my bow. I'm helpless. Am I supposed to make widows? Is that what I'm supposed to do? It's a difficult question. You can feel the, the, the uh, anguish that is in that. And the first thing Krishna says to him, he says, you are not a body. You are the Atma. You were never born. You will never die. In an interview that Swami Westerners, myself in Kodai Canal, the very first time I went to Kodai, it was a remarkable experience for me because I was told to remain at uh, Prashanti Nil at the time. And uh, somehow, in the most remarkable way, I was transported. Uh, it's, a, it's a long story I won't tell right now. But uh, there he got uh, 70 devotees, 70, 80 perhaps, less than 100 devotees at that moment. And of those, about 45 or 50 were Westerners who somehow got the word, all like myself, in a most remarkable way. And we came together. Swami gave an interview uh, to us. And he said, you were never born. You will never... You are the Atma, not these bodies. 
don't think of yourself this way. This is the first thing that Krishna said to us. So, as long as we still hold on to these identities that we have n nurtured for so in many with a limited maya idea, maya, that would nothing, that not, huh? but nevertheless with that, an ego, going God, as long as that pace and seconds from midnight, being home, this is of awakening, go of all these deeply rutted idea past, and that's going to be a little different, because they cling us, they hold on to us, and so we become used, we don't know what to do, and we become depressed, and we become anxious, and we become like Arjuna in that moment, prepared for all life, and Krishna said, you will fight despite yourself. It is already in your nature, your pure soul, and you, will, you have come to support and, and, and uh, protect the Dharma. This is a time to change the of, of uh, materialism and, and, uh, and uh, ignorance, the truth. And you are the, the one that I've chosen this. And so Krishna gave him the Gita. He will give a Gita to all of us. And itself will bring on that Gita. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be depressed. It means that we're still holding on. And the blessed Lord is not going to let us hold on very long. Mm -hmm. And so he will come. And, and all you have to do is say help, which is what Arjuna did. He said help. And whatever follows will be the direction from the Lord, because our minds are all powerful. Like nothing can resist these minds. Your mind, let me just say it, your mind is all powerful. Your mind is the mind of God. You have chosen to identify yourself with something small, but that doesn't change your mind. Your mind is still the divine mind. It is all powerful, and all you have to say is help, and your very own mind, that part of your mind that has not become confused, will arrange for you to get your own Gita. Gita is the song of God, is the song of liberation. One final question. Yes. You raised the subject of the Course in Miracles. Baba has said that he is the author of the Course in Miracles. Yes. You said the Course in Miracles is not for everybody. Why? Let it be directed to you personally. Ask Swami. You have your way of asking. Ask. Ask and see if it's right for you. I was directed towards it. I have to tell you, like The Course in Miracles was first channeled. Channeled is probably not the right word. It was more dictated. It was dictated to a psychi psychologist, psychiatrist, at Columbia University at Presbyterian Hospital in, in New York, Helen Schuchman, uh, because she was having such troubles in her work and she was a pure soul, if you read a little bit of her life. And she just suddenly got this voice that said, get your pen and start taking dictation. And she took this dictation. When it was, there were some 30 odd chapters dictated as part of a text. And then there were 365 lessons, a lesson for every day of the year that was dictated following that. And then there was a, another little uh, book called the Manual for Teachers, saying that you are all teachers, you are all teachers of God, you are all teachers of love, teach only love. And that was also dictated. And that has, those have been put together and has, has become the Course in Miracles. When the first 10 chapters had been dictated. The first 10 chapters of all the rest that I just m mentioned, um, a psychiatrist whose name was Laura Pearls, who was a good friend of Helen's, Helen Schuchman, who took the dictation, uh, was given the first typewritten um, manuscript of those first 10 lessons. Ten, uh, chapters of the text. And Laura, who was separated from her husband, Fritz Pearls, a great psychiatrist who at that time had had 
a number of heart attacks and had come to and was at Esalen at the institute where I was living and teaching in, in, on the West Coast and who had been miraculously saved by Ida Rolf, who was invited to come there and who then developed her Rolfing. I mean, all of this is part of my history. And I was Fritz Perls' assistant. And I was living there at, at Esalen. And, for, and I was just helping this old man out in every way that he, to uh, get him to help him do his life's work, which was Gestalt therapy, which has become the principal um, method of clinical psychology today. Uh, and Laura, his wife, came, uh, also a psychiatrist, came to visit from New York, and she brought with her the MS of the first 10 chapters of the Course in Miracles. So, ten, the first 10 chapters of the Course in Miracles. Laura Hurls, huh, gives it to her husband, Fritz Pearls, whom she visits once a year, and Fritz takes a look at it and it says, Jesus, 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 what do I want with Jesus? And he just throws the thing to me and he says, here is this miracle thing. <laughs> and I look at it and I see Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and what's a nice Jewish boy like me have to do with... <laughs> And I put it aside. <laughs> and 30 odd years later, it comes back to me. We have a, um, somebody is showing a video and it was some g great um, spiritual light. I think it was a Papaji, a uh, Punjaji. And uh, th they mixed up the cases. <laughs> and uh, in the case, out comes uh, the Wapnakes talking about the Course in Miracles. <laughs> and so I watched this video of the Course in Miracles. And something in me just talks to me and says, this is your next bus stop. <laughs> and so it's come to me. So if it comes to you, ask. Ask if it's right for you. What is missing for me in the Course, although it's very much there, but it doesn't have the sweetness of the heart. It isn't quite, it assumes that you've gone through, that you're at that stage. I mentioned yesterday, there's sort of three steps. There's karma yoga, hmm? there is the bhakti yoga, and there's the jnana yoga. Swami spoke to all three of those in the Sai Baba Gita. It goes straight, it is a narrow path straight up a mountain to the ultimate recognition of who we are, the Jnana Yoga, huh? that union with truth, with the wisdom of who I, who I am as one with God. And for some of us who like to taste the sugar, it may not quite be the path as yet. So ask, and it will be shown you. I'm told we have a little more time. A couple more questions on the list here that people have submitted. How is it that I cannot stay in contact with Sai Baba now like before? I can't stay in contact with Sai Baba now as before. Before, I made some 30, 35 trips to Swami sometimes two, usually three times a year. After doing my workshop, I had a, a workshop at Esalen. I would do that workshop and then go off to India. I had three months free in between, generally, between the three months workshop. And I just want to go off to India. And I made all those many trips, and then one day Swami told me, now you come. It was, uh, he sent a really tough cookie to me. This man was in his late 60s. He had just retired from Harvard Medical School. He had been head of a uh, department of internal medicine at Harvard Medical School. And God knows why that man would come to Esalen Institute and take my, uh, at that time, three-month workshop on alternative systems of, of healing. 
uh, the workshop uh, taught many different systems of healing, including uh, homeopathy and the wealthing and uh, herbal medicine and uh, yoga medicine and, and, and different things that were of interest to those who had that kind of a mind. And this man just gave me a continuous hard time. And so in between, in the middle of uh, our three-month program, um, at Easter time, we, no, no, it was past Easter time, it was, uh, it was already um, end of May. I went, um, I took a few days off and went to Swami. And Swami called me right in and he said, that old man is giving you such a hard time. I said, yes, Swami. He says, why do you need this? Come, be with me and you'll be free. You don't need money. You don't need marriage. You don't need fame. All of those will give you pain. <laughs> marriage, money, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> marriage, money, fame equals pain. Come be with me and you'll be free. I said, yes, Swami, I'll, uh, I'll come. Uh, it will take me a year or two to sort of close off my, uh, my program at Esalen and to, uh, I had some land up there in Big Sur to sell that and take care of things. He said, no, 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 not like that. You come back for Guru Purnima. Guru Purnima at that time was, it was in the middle end of June, sometime in, uh, towards the end of June. This was the end of May. It was a little bit more than three weeks. He said, go home, close everything up. You don't need to do anything more in America. America finished. You come and, and be with me. And so I had no choice, really. And I went and lived there and came and, and uh, in the most remarkable way, everything was taken care of. Somebody, it was a piece of land that uh, was very difficult to develop because of uh, some legal situation. And uh, I didn't see how I could get, to get uh, how I could uh, let go of it, you know, uh, sell it. And in the most remarkable way, everything got taken care of. Somebody came and said, I want it. I want it. I said, there's going to be problems. He said, I don't care what it is. I, uh, I'll pay you whatever here. I'll, uh, and, and like that. Everything. And so the only thing that was still keeping me was I had uh, some old parents my mother at that time was 91 and my father was 94. Mm. And they were kind of dependent on me. My father was because on two occasions he had been in the ICU in, in a hospital. He, was, uh, he had heart attacks. And uh, in both cases he was uh, fading fast. And in one of those cases his heart actually stopped. And I they were in, uh, in Los Angeles at that time in a hospital. I was up in Big Sur and I drove as fast as I could down to Los Angeles. And Swami showed me and he showed me that there was a homeopathic remedy that was going to save that man. And I couldn't get it into him. I, you know, he had this mask and this uh, oxygen on, on his face and he was all wired up. And the only thing, uh, and I saw the remedy. He d there was something very unusual of what he w wanted that he never in his whole life ever c cared about and that spoke to me of that remedy. It spoke to me of, of uh, uh, phosphorus. I, I mean, the, the details are not important. You know, I'm trained as a homeopath. And I could see a remedy. And I just ran out to the car to get that remedy. By the time I got back the, uh, um, on the oscilloscope, his pulse was, uh, was flat. And I just had to get it into him somehow, and I just rubbed it on his wrist, and I just rubbed it on his wrist, and you could just see, rum, 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 and the heart just uh, came up. And uh, uh, he came back to life. It was Swami. I mean, I just had like this intuition, and it was just given to me. And then uh, it happened again at a, at a later time. And again, he came back to, and so I just, uh, he became very dependent on me, you know, that I would sort of keep him alive. And so now, um, I'm given these three weeks to, to come back to come back for Pur uh, Guru Purnima uh, to India and Swami said all of America is finished for you you don't have to do any more and what about my old parents and so on the 
um, day that I was to pick up my ticket. It was a Friday night, we're, uh, as you know by now, uh, with Jewish background. And my father would go to the temple, and he went to the temple, and he came home, it's Friday night, he comes home to the Shabbat meal, and he has his meal, and he sits down in his chair, and he just mm. goes to sleep, and he breathes his last, and my mother calls me, and she says, uh, son, your father has departed, it is all right, I am fine, it was, a, it was beautiful, and, uh, and come, and uh, uh, there is, in the Jewish tradition, to use, it's called sitting shiva, shiva, yeah. uh, you come and, uh, and, uh, and be with him, be with, uh, with us, and then go off to India, it is fine, I will be fine. And s everything got taken care of in those three and a half weeks and including a huge amount of money that just suddenly came to me. <laughs> and I had no idea where it came from. I mean, it was, they said that there was a, uh, um, an account in some savings and loan association in, in uh, Redlands, Redlands? Somewhere in California, some town I'd never been in, that it was in my name and they found me through the driver's license and they s sent me all this money. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And the first thing I did with this check is when I got to Swami, I just put it on this chair. It's your money, it's not mine. And that's how I happened to get uh, this uh, um, incredible place on top of the round building, you know, oh. up on top the, uh, <laughs> what do you call it, the penthouse uh, suite, you know. It, I mean, I didn't do anything. It was just all given to me. I forget what led me into this long story. What was the question? Does anybody about? remember? <laughs> <laughs> So I did a tease, uh, why are they always poor? No, no, that wasn't the question. <laughs> they already answered that one. Why some of us feel separate from Swami at this point? Yes, why, yes. why some... No, no, the question was, uh, does it change? Yeah. Does the, your relationship to Swami change? Yeah. <laughs> isn't, wasn't that yeah, essentially that's the question? question. Yeah. And so for years following that, I was at Prashanti Nilayam and I was given a, 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 a duty to do and it was to talk to the Westerners when they came. I mean, I'd give the, um, uh, in those early days, it's Kasturi and Kasturi's son and myself would give the daily talks. And then, uh, I mean, and I had no idea how to do that. I was just a shy little refugee boy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it came from, a, from Germany just before the, before the war, we were saved. And, uh, and I was just a very shy kid. And, but uh, Swami said, you do it, and it's given to do. And, uh, um, and then I was teaching at the university and I was given all these tasks to do, uh, to do the st study circle for, for both the professors and also for the students. I mean, it was a, it was, I was busy all the time. And, uh, and then Swami called on me lots and lots of times. I mean, people would send me pictures of me and Swami because Swami would always talk to me. Every day he talked to me. Every day. Uh, there was, no, I don't think there was a day that was skipped when he wouldn't say something to me. Uh, and then uh, one day it all changed. And it changed. Are we still on? Yeah. Um, he just didn't talk to me. He didn't come by. And that went on and on and on and it was a whole year. Mm. And at the end of the year he still hadn't talked to me. And that's when I got very sick and uh, I was in the hospital and, uh, and then Swami sent word that I had to leave the hospital. I had to go back to America to get treatment. Mm. He sent for one of my students at Esalen. Um, this, uh, this fellow normally, he, he lived in Canada and he would normally come uh, during the cold of the, uh, of the Canadian winter. He would come in February, but uh, this was um, Dasura time, so that this was October, and Swami came to him that night and said, you go and, and collect Drucker. And so he, uh, he came and he was there for one darshan and Swami said, he's in the hospital, go get him. And, um, and Adi is his name is, uh, came and, and took me home. And as I, I was just sort of carried on board the the airplane, and I was sort of crumpled into a seat along the window, barely alive, and the plane was flying um, out of uh, Delhi, uh, flying east, flying across 
Coast, uh, India, and just as we passed the coastline, um, I sort of out of my sleepy eyes, I sort of uh, look down and I see the coastline of India, and suddenly all this Shakti just sort of comes into me and I just bolt upright and just shake myself as I've seen Swami do, you know, when, he, when he's, like I, I described this other story. I mean, it literally happened to me and the whole thing just fell off me. And I was just good as gold and, <laughs> and uh, all that illness, whatever it was, was finished. And so my years in India were done. I tried coming back two times, and both times I had uh, major adventures. It was clear, it, I mean, I wouldn't uh, listen to my own inner source that said, this is done for you. And so I needed to come in again, and Swami ignored me, but gave me a very hard time in many different ways. And then the third time I came, I was in the ashram for about uh, 30, sec 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And a volunteer came up to me and said, uh, you have to leave, sir. You have to be outside. And I was outside with the dogs um, <laughs> at the gate. Mm. And I was thrown out of the ashram because it was time for the next phase, the next part of the adventure. Huh? And I was devastated because I was holding on to some ideas and I had no idea what I'd done. Why am I being thrown out? It made no sense to me. Now I see it as the greatest gift that was ever given to me. I could not have come into the, the true gift that has been given to me, to come into this uh, place within myself, had I remained there, at least as I see it now. I mean, Swami is totally internalized. I don't know the difference between me and Swami. I can say that directly. I don't know the difference. I know who I am. And I am Swami. I am not that Swami that, you know, now you go out and give darshan. It's not that. Swami said to me, he said, this body is an ordinary body. He spoke of himself, of his body. He said, this is an ordinary body, but this body has come on a holy mission on a great mission. And so it will be used for that. You can say that. Everyone here can say that. I can say that. It's been given to me to say, but it's been given to me to pass that on to you also. That is your story. This body has been given to me. It's a vehicle. It's the same vehicle that you left out there in the parking lot so that you can go now and do your work. And that work is to bring the love of God into, and the light of God into those that still think that they are limited and, and uh, caught up in this non-existing world. There's no world here except in your mind. And it's a mind that is totally caught up in its own importance, in its own arrogance. True humility will see that I am God itself, I am no different from God. And that's what God, uh, what Swami said. He said, this avatar does not give mantra, but I will give you a mantra and I want you to say it three times a day. I am God, I am God, I am no different from God. I am the Satchitananda Swarupa. I am Tatsat, I am all of it. I am peace, I am love, I am pure delight. Own it, be it. Dust if you are, dust you. Dust if you think, dust you are. Huh? God if you think, God you are. Why would you continue to think the arrogance of thinking that you're small when the truth is that you are all of it? Think God, be God. Al Drucker, you are you. our Psy brother. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you, the one who is listening most carefully to all of this is me. Let me take another quick second and just say something. Swami tells the story of a guru who has a particular puja that he does every day. And for that puja, he needs fresh,
coconut milk every day. And he has a sishya, he has a, um, a woman who is his student, who is his disciple, and she lives on the other side of the river. And she, and there there are coconut palms, there are no coconut palms on this side of the river. And so every day she brings him fresh coconut milk for his puja. And one day she doesn't show up for his morning puja. And she doesn't come until late in the afternoon. And he is really deeply troubled because he was not able to do his daily puja. And he said, why didn't you come? What happened? And she said, Swami, did you look outside? The river is in spade. It is flooded. I couldn't walk across the river as I do every day. I had to go down river and find a ferryman and even the ferryman was unwilling to take me and I had to convince him and he took me across the river and then I had to come up here and it took a lot of time. And he, he said to her, if you believed in God, if you believed in the truth of what I'm teaching you, you would have just said, Gopala, Govinda, Krishna, and you would have walked across the water. There is no reason for you not to bring me my puja articles every day because you are my sishya and this is the means for your awakening. From that day on, every day, the coconut milk came at the right time. He did his uh, pujas and there was much happiness in that shrine room when they did their, uh, their pujas together. And one day the guru had a little doubt. He said, how did she do that? Because the river has been uh, flooded many times. And so he said, all right, let me try it. And he went out and he sa started saying, Gopala, Govinda, Krishna. And he hiked up his dhoti and he stepped into the water to thinking he would walk on top of the water and he just fell right in. He hiked up his dhoti. <laughs> he had wow. so much trust that he hiked up his dhoti, right? <laughs> and of course he fell in. So Swami tells that story. He says, that guru was teaching the truth. And the one who heard, heard that truth in her pure heart, in her pure mind. She was given the truth and she was free. That guru did not trust his own words, but that doesn't mean that his words were not true. He passed on the truth to her and she became free. I say that because I am also listening to words that come through, as do all of you when you come into the position of, of teaching. These are not my words. These are words that are given. Mm -hmm. And I am as, as interested an observer and, uh, and student of these words as anyone. We are all saviors to each other. We cannot do it alone. We cannot even do it with Swami. We need each other. We need our brother in the sense of brother, which is not, doesn't speak of male or female as the Course speaks of it. Our brother is our savior. Our sweeper is our true savior. And so listen to your own words sometimes coming back through your brother. That's what's going to set you free. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sorry,
respecting and abiding by it.